This conference will now be recorded. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's enjoying this sunshiny day. It's nice to get some uh, nice weather here this February since it's been so bleak with all the snow, but I think we got some spring around the corner. So thank you for joining us as we introduce you to the Larry Children's team from the Division of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. For this session, we are introducing you to Dr. Greg Van Lason, and he will be talking to you about OCD. But before we get to Dr. Van Lason, I'd like to talk to you a bit about our Division of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. We are nationally ranked by US News and World Report. We care for more than 30,000 children each year, providing a range of services for children with bone, joint, muscle, ligament, tendon, and nerve disorders. And we offer the only pediatric bone health program in Illinois. And this is how we were able to recruit these fine specialists, in the, like the finest specialists in the nation, such as Dr. Finlayson. The Knee Injury Prevention Program, also known as KIPP, is a neuromuscular training program designed to reduce the risk of ACL injuries among female adolescent athletes. KIPP for Coaches is a free online training program to help coaches reduce the risk of ACL tears and other lower extremity injuries in their athletes from ages 10 to 21. In KIPP training, coaches learn how to lead their athletes through 10 minute warm up routine that includes strength training exercises, plyometrics, balance training, agility drills, and active stretching. Our club foot program is a comprehensive multidisciplinary program for club foot, a congenital condition that can affect one or both feet in newborns. The concussion program is uniquely qualified to evaluate, manage, and treat concussions in children and adolescents. I would like to remind you that our new Skokie site is now up and running. We have over 20 specialties, including orthopedic surgery, sports medicine, and cat care services. Our sports medicine team is there five days a week, one is which Dr. Greg Finlayson. Dr. Finlayson has been a member of the Division of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine at Lurie Children's since 2010. In addition to completing a fellowship in pediatric orthopedics, he pursued additional subspecialty training in pediatric sports medicine at Boston Children's Hospital, working with patients of all age groups, including youth sports, collegiate athletics, and professional ballet. His clinical interests include ACL and meniscal tears, OCD, and arthroscopic, arthroscopic surgical techniques. Dr. Finlayson is proficient in growth respecting techniques for ACL reconstruction, as well as joint preservation surgeries, including meniscal and repairs and transplants. I encourage you to ask as many questions as you can in the chat room, and then after Dr. Finlayson's presentation we will go ahead and ask the questions and have a nice dialogue back and forth but without further ado dr finlayson i give it to you and you can tell everybody how to pronounce ocd for me sure yeah well um hi it's great to be here virtually thank you all for um coming today um so yeah we're going to be talking about ocd or um, osteochondritis dissecans, or um, as my partner, Dr. Patel, who's on the line as well, likes to say um, dissecans, but either way, I think is fine. Um, I'm just going to call it OCD for the rest of the talk. Um, let me see. Am I sharing my screen right now? Can you see my... Um, Can't see it yet, doctor. Let's go to the share screen. Uh-oh, we've got some freezing here. Sorry. It's okay. Take take your time. We'll get there. Okay. There we go. Whoops. I do not want that. How's that? No screen yet. If you hover there we go. at the bottom. There we go. 
All right. All right. About that. All right. And let me go to slideshow. Great. All right. Everyone's got that? Yep. Great. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about OCD today. Um, so this is, it's still relatively rare, um, but it's being seen um, with increasing frequency and in younger patients. Um, it's a cause of chronic joint pain and it can cause you know, irreversible degenerative changes in the joint. Sometimes the diagnosis can be a little bit tough to make. Um, it's a frustrating condition because um, the healing process is often quite protracted. Um, it can take three to six months or even longer. Sometimes surgery or multiple surgeries are required to address the symptoms. So it's really important that we make the appropriate diagnosis, that we educate our patients, and that we um, treat these appropriately. Um, unfortunately, if it's incompletely or inadequately treated, again, it can lead to um, irreversible changes, so loose body formation or degenerative changes in the joint. So what is it? Um, well, uh, it's a great question, but it is primarily a problem of the bone, so the subchondral bone just beneath the cartilage. Um, and this bone um, starts to delaminate and it kind of becomes sequestered from the rest of the bone surrounding it. And then secondarily, the cartilage can become involved. And in some cases, that piece can become unstable or even detached. So it's an acquired, uh, potentially reversible condition. And there is some genetic predisposition that's not fully defined yet, um, but there are indications that there's a genetic basis for it. And the most common location by far is the knee. Um, and then the second most common is the elbow. So this was first described um, a long time ago, 130 years ago. Um, and it comes from the Latin osteochondritis, which implies an inflammatory origin, which uh, is, may or may not be true. And then desiccans comes from the Latin for um, to separate or dissect. Um, and um, it was noted that there were young patients that developed these loose bodies and otherwise um, normal healthy knees. And that's um, when the uh, condition was actually discovered and um, described. It's most commonly associated with repetitive trauma. So most of these patients are um, participants in athletics, regular athletics. Um, and there are a lot of theories um, as to why it happens. Um, localized ischemia, inflammation, or abnormalities in the ossification of the bone. Um, but the most common link that we find is really repetitive trauma or increased forces on the joint. So again, we talk about athletics and especially repetitive high impact athletics. But we also know that um, in young patients who've had um, a meniscectomy for various reasons can develop OCD. So here's a patient who's had a, um, a meniscectomy for a discoid meniscus and then has developed this osteochondral lesion right here um, in the area where the meniscus should be. And we also know that um, people that have mechanical axis issues, so um, valgus or varus deformity are at risk. So patients with a valgus or a knock knee deformity are um, higher risk for lateral lesions and vice versa with our medial lesions. And we do know that it's been associated with earlier entry into sports and sports specialization. A number of um, genetic loci have been identified um, as potential um, contributors to OCD. A lot of these are um, collagen or other um, proteins that are involved with the um, extracellular matrix. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of reports of twins, siblings, and extended families with OCD. Um, but if you look, there's only about a 15% of these patients have a positive family history. So um, there's probably some genetic predisposition and then, again, um, issues with kind of biomechanical uh, forces in the knee. So to kind of put it all together, um, we see there are mechanical issues, so injury overuse, problems with the meniscus or the um, joint alignment, and then there are biologic factors, so genetic factors, um, issues with um, ossification and bone formation, and those all kind of combine to create um, this um, process that leads to OCD. So in the knee, um, which is again the most common place we see it, the classic location is right here on the medial femoral condyle. That's where probably 75% of these lesions occur. And then there's a smattering on the lateral side or um, uh, even more rarely in the trochlea or the patella. 
it's important to know that up to 30% may be bilateral, and many patients um, will only have symptoms on one side. Um, so it's not uncommon that we see a patient for an OCD and we get an x-ray the other side and we see maybe a smaller lesion on the other side or um, some other um, lesion and they may not really even have significant symptoms from it. In the elbow, it's almost always in the capitellum laterally um, and it occurs almost exclusively in throwers or upper extremity athletes like gymnasts and tumblers. Um, and so when the gymnasts are loading that elbow in extension, uh, we tend to see the lesions more distally on the capitellum. So here's a, a defect with a loose body and a gymnast. Um, our pitchers, um, because they're loading the elbow in flexion, they tend to be a little bit more anterior. Um, but again, this can vary even um, among patients. So what's the natural history of these? Um, some of these juvenile OCDs are stable lesions and they can heal uh, with appropriate time and rest. Um, unfortunately, if they don't heal, they can cause persistent pain and um, that bone can progressively delaminate and uh, detach and eventually become um, unstable. So here's a, a case, a small lesion here that goes on to heal quite nicely. Um, then here's a case in the femur where you see this lesion here and then it um, progresses to a loose body. Um, so you actually see it detached there. Um, there is adult OCD. Uh, and for the most part, we think that's probably just juvenile OCD that has persisted into adulthood. So we define adult OCD as um, uh, OCD in the setting of a closed growth plate. So here you see a, an OCD lesion in a patient whose growth plates are closed. Unfortunately, once you get to this point, once the phyces are closed, the healing potential is really quite limited. And so spontaneous healing or healing without intervention is very rare. So again, it's still relatively rare. Um, if you look at the incidence, it's probably about 10 per 100,000. Um, but again, that is increasing in incidence and we're seeing it at younger ages. Males are definitely at higher risk than females, especially for the knee. Although in the elbow, it seems to be a little bit more of an equal opportunity um, diagnosis, given the number of women that do gymnastics. Um, it seems to be more common in the adolescent and teens as opposed to the younger children. Um, so really, we don't see it very often until um, adolescence. Um, how do they present? So that's a great question. Um, very rarely does the patient come to their PCP and say, I think I have OCD. Uh, maybe they do, but um, most of the time they're coming in with kind of activity-related pain. It can often be kind of nonspecific or vague knee pain, joint pain. Um, sometimes they will have pain that's localized to the area of the lesion, but oftentimes, especially in the knee, there's superimposed patellofemoral pain, apophysitis, you know, Osgood-Schlatter, um, tendonitis, and so that can really kind of mask this diagnosis. Um, and often those patients kick around for a year or longer before they're actually diagnosed. Um, and so they're just told, you know, it's growing pain, it's patellofemoral, you need to do some PT, you need to rest. Um, and it's, it just kind of smolders for a long time. Sometimes they will present with an acute injury or pain. Um, and this I tend to see more often in our gymnasts and upper extremity athletes where um, they're doing that tumbling pass or they're throwing, you know, um, that fastball and all of a sudden they feel a pop and that lesion is actually detached. Um, so the piece of bone and cartilage um, comes out. Um, it's you know, acutely painful, swollen, and it'll have those mechanical symptoms. But that's actually relatively rare. Um, some patients will have swelling um, and some will have a limp. Um, and then mechanical symptoms are present um, in our higher grade lesions where you're starting to see some instability of that lesion and you're catching, popping, locking, um, or loss of motion. Again, this seems to be more common in the elbows um, than the knees. Um, so an exam, you may be able to elicit some tenderness over the lesion, um, although not always. Um, you may be able to load the lesion. So if it's in the elbow, you can do a, a valgus stress test and see if that um, reproduces pain. And you can do that in the knee as well, varus valgus. Um, there's a test called the Wilson's test in which you internally rotate the tibia and flex the knee. And that may cause some impingement of the tibial spine that reproduces pain, but it's a pretty non-specific um, test. And then again, you may have some effusion or some crepitus um, with joint motion, um, as well as some loss of motion or guarding. 
So um, x-rays are really the key to diagnosis. Um, so, you know, if you have a patient who comes in with um, symptoms that are concerning for OCD, um, which, you know, any kind of repetitive impact athlete, gymnast um, is going to be at high risk, um, we should get x-rays. Um, and the x-rays can actually be relatively subtle. Um, sometimes you'll see a little subchondral lucency right here. It's a little kind of dark spot. Sometimes you just see a little change in the contour of the bone. So in the elbow, there's kind of two articular surfaces. So you can see the trochlea here has got a nice round contour. And then the capitellum is kind of flat and looks a little kind of moth-eaten. Um, and then in other cases, um, you may see that actually very well-defined um, fragment, that progeny fragment, as we like to call it. And obviously, loose body uh, is an option as well. So for the knee, we really need more than just the standard two views. Um, these lesions do have a tendency to kind of hide. Um, so here's a lesion that's in the trochlea. It's a little bit subtle here. Um, but when you see our merchant view, you can see that lesion, that lucency right in here. And then the classic example are these lesions on the uh, posterior aspect of the femoral condyle. So here's the AP view, and you can kind of see a little something here, but it's pretty subtle. And then when you do that view with the knee and a little bit more flexion, that lesion really comes more into profile, and you can see it much more clearly. Once the diagnosis is made on x-ray or you're suspicious of the diagnosis on x-ray, an MRI is really the next step. And it's really the gold standard. It helps us really evaluate the lesion and it guides our treatment. Um, so we can really see the size and location. It also allows us to see the condition of the cartilage um, and the subchondral bone and allows us to determine whether we think this is a stable lesion or an unstable lesion. And that's gonna guide our treatment. When we talk about stable versus unstable, a stable lesion is like this where the cartilage um, is intact and the subchondral bone, which is this dark black line, is also intact. In an unstable lesion, you can actually see a little crack in the cartilage as well as in the um, subchondral bone. You can see this fluid kind of tracking behind the lesion. And once that happens, um, the lesion um, becomes much less likely to heal on its own. And those are patients that we're typically thinking more about surgery for. There are occasionally some false positives. So in our younger kids, usually like less than 10, sometimes you'll see these little irregularities in the back, especially laterally. Um, and when you get an MRI, um, you can see some little kind of um, cystic changes in the bone or irregular ossification, but there's really no swelling uh, in the bone around there. And um, we think these are probably just variations in ossification. So um, every now and then we'll see that false positive. The MRI, um, again, is a, is a good test, but it's not perfect. So really arthroscopy is the gold standard to evaluate these. Um, and so here's a lesion that looks, you know, like it's pretty um, potentially unstable. It looks like it's very um, fragmented and there's a large cyst in the bone. But when we actually go in with our scope, um, the cartilage is intact. You can kind of see this little swelling around the edge of this kind of loss and contour, this shading. Um, but the actual lesion itself is stable when we probe it. Um, this is one of my favorite things about OCD, actually. And I'm not a big classification guy, but most orthopedic classifications have Roman numerals or letters or numbers. Um, but this is a fun one that actually has is a descriptive classification. So based on how it looks when we get in there with our scope. So they have things like the cue ball, uh, where it's completely smooth, or the shadow, which is what we saw before. Uh, and then things like a trapdoor, where the lesion is um, kind of hinged open, um, but still intact on one side. And then, of course, the crater. Um, so here's just an example of um, our arthroscopic evaluation. So here's a patient uh, with a lesion here, which, again, is actually relatively subtle on the x-ray. On the MRI, you see this very well-defined fragment with fluid kind of all around it. And here's how it looks when we go in there. So here's the area of the lesion. And this kid was complaining of mechanical symptoms popping in the knee. And you can see how that lesion is detached. And as we move, it's actually kind of popping in and out of that little um, defect. So you can imagine this would not be very comfortable to um, try to run around on um, and do sports. So how do we treat these? Um, and that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of debate about how to treat these. 
But basically, our, our treatment is really based on how likely we think this bone is to heal on its own. So if we think the lesion is stable based on the MRI um, and also the clinical findings, clinical symptoms, um, so mechanical symptoms would certainly indicate instability. Um, so stable lesions can heal on their own. Unstable lesions are much less likely to heal on their own. If they have an open growth plate, that's a good thing. If they have a closed growth plate, it's probably not going to heal. Smaller is better than larger. And then the big thing um, that we have to think about are the, actually the biomechanics of the joint. So we said, you know, people that have a valgus deformity um, or a problem with the meniscus um, can develop these lesions. So if they do have one of those coexisting problems, again, that's going to be less likely to heal on its own. So we use the MRI a lot and the clinical findings. Um, and then also kind of the chronicity as well. Um, is this a lesion that's been present for a long time? Have they had symptoms for a long time? Maybe less likely to heal on its own. So for stable lesions, um, again, we can treat these non-operatively. Um, the problem with that is no one really agrees on what is appropriate treatment. And a lot of people have different theories. The idea is to kind of minimize the stress on the bone and allow it to heal. Um, so some people will recommend crutches. Some people will just say no sports. Um, some people use a brace or a cast. Um, some people recommend doing physical therapy to kind of maintain the joint range of motion and strength um, in the joint, but minimize the loading of that area. And no one really agrees on the duration. So is it three months? Is it six months? Um, how do we assess healing? So um, there's really no consensus on what is the optimal non-operative management or duration, really. So we see a lot of kids who come in, they've been diagnosed, and the parents want to know, do we need surgery or is this going to heal on its own? And some people have developed normograms to kind of help assess or determine, predict what the likelihood of healing is, and it's based on the size of the lesion and other factors. Um, but a number of these studies have shown um, that, you know, the rates of healing, you know, we're talking about 50 percent, 60 percent, um, and which is basically kind of a coin flip. And some of these studies looked at a time frame of six months or a year. And really, most patients aren't really going to be willing to wait a year um, for these things to heal. And some studies showed that a lot of these lesions actually got worse uh, over that time period. So unfortunately, we see a lot of kids that are in this what I call OCD purgatory. So they have a stable lesion. So there's some potential that it could heal. The symptoms are kind of manageable. So they have some pain. Um, but, you know, they kind of are modifying it a little bit. You know, maybe they're not playing travel, but they're playing house league or they're still doing gym. Parents are nervous about surgery. Um, and so, you know, they get in a situation where, you know, I see them and I say, well, it might heal. They come back in six weeks. Well, it doesn't look different. It doesn't look worse. And I keep going, keep going. And sometimes they might be better off had they just had surgery initially. But it can sometimes take a little while to get to that place with the family where they're ready to um, do surgery on the knee. So for me, the patients who really need surgery um, are those that have unstable lesions. Um, patients who have a stable lesion that has not healed with conservative treatment, uh, or patients who have closed growth plates and a symptomatic OCD. And then our relative indications are patients that have lesions in both knees. So if you have two lesions and they both have a 65 or a, you know, 75% chance of healing, um, then the chance that they'll both heal is only about 50%. So um, you're just kind of decreasing your odds when you have bilateral or multiple lesions. And then again, if they have other, other biomechanical factors, so uh, uh, malalignment or a meniscus problem, then those are patients that I am typically thinking about surgery for. So our guiding principles are we really want to preserve the patient's native bone and cartilage because that's, for the most part, it's better than anything we can put in there um, or replace it with. Um, but in some situations we have to recognize that that bone and cartilage is not really viable anymore. So we have to do something to replace it. So we want to improve the local environment, the local biology. So we want to stimulate and optimize the healing response of the bone. We want to get rid of any dead bone, sclerotic bone, or fibrous tissue that's kind of impeding the healing. Because we want those two pieces of bone to heal back together. So 
if there's a bunch of schmutz in between those two ends of bone, it's going to be hard for them to get back together. And then we want to replace unhealthy or absent bone. And then secondly, we want to decrease the load on the lesion, so the mechanical forces. So we do that by doing protected weight bearing, activity modification. If a lesion is unstable, we'll often um, add some internal fixation. So we'll put some screws in to stabilize that lesion so it's not moving. Uh, we may need to realign the knee, so correct any deformity, and we may need to address the meniscus. So here are just some examples of how we do it. So for the stable lesions, this what we call marrow stimulation or um, drilling is really the most common thing that people call it. Um, and um, Dr. Ganley from Philadelphia is the guy who gave me this um, phrase, but taught me this, but he calls it like CPR for the bone. So that bone is basically dead. Um, we're trying to revive it. So what do we do? We punch a bunch of holes in it with a drill to kind of stimulate a healing response. It also punctures that border around the lesion and it creates channels for cells in the healthy bone to migrate into that area of bone and um, allow it to heal. And you can do it different ways. You can actually drill right through the cartilage and into the bone um, while, right, while you're looking at it through the scope, or you can do it from the outside in. So um, we can make a little incision and then drill down into the lesion and maintain that cartilage, keep the cartilage intact, um, but drill into it from above or below. So here's an example of a 12-year-old uh, who had pain um, and failed conservative treatment. You can see his lesion right here. And then we take him to the OR, and when we look in with a scope, we can see the cartilage is actually still intact. And we drill a bunch of holes in that lesion, and it goes on to heal. For our unstable lesions, again, we can sometimes add this internal fixation. So here's a case where we added these two screws, um, and we bury them below the cartilage so that you know they're not rubbing on the other side of the joint. Um, when you do the x-ray, sometimes it looks like they're sticking out. Um, it's because they are sticking out of the bone a little bit, but there's cartilage over the top. Um, but here's a nice one. You can see a CT scan that shows it healing nicely. Um, sometimes we'll actually um, open up that lesion and we can remove that unhealthy bone or fibrous tissue that's in that interface between what we call the parent bone, which is the main part of the bone, and the progeny, which is that little tiny fragment. So this is a volleyball player who had a lesion, and you can see this kind of um, folding of the cartilage around that lesion. And we actually went in with a knife, um, opened that up, and then we can go in and scrape out all that um, schmutz, basically, in between there, add some new bone, put it back down, and screw it in place. And sometimes these patients, again, are going to present with an acute injury and a detached fragment. and um, Many of these are actually salvageable. So if there's a reasonable amount of bone on that fragment, you can actually put it back in and a lot of these will heal. So here's a case where there's a large defect in the lateral condyle and then a big loose body, which we can see here and here. And when we um, do our procedure, we can see again this huge defect in the um, condyle. It's almost the whole lateral condyle right there. And here's the piece. So we take the piece out and we actually clean it off, scrape all the um, Kind of fibrous tissue off of it but it's about three and a half centimeters so quite large clean up the defect or the bed where it came from um, screw it back in place and then this one actually went on to heal um, subsequently took the hardware out and he did well unfortunately a lot of these are not really salvageable um, and so we have to do other things um, so microfracture is good for our small shallow lesions so it's Kind of like a pothole on the road, right? So all potholes are not created equal, right? So some are really deep and large, and you know you got to get your alignment checked after you drive through. And some are really small and shallow. So for these small, shallow ones, doing something like a microfracture is a nice, quick, easy procedure. So we just remove the unstable bone and cartilage, and then um, again poke some holes into that subchondral bone. Um, it allows the stem cells to kind of fill in that defect and form a new cartilage. It's not as good as the cartilage you're born with, but um, it kind of fills that defect in and smooths it out. And then we can augment that with various little um, orthobiologics. So here's one where you can see the cartilage and bone is really not um, salvageable. We've cleaned that up um, and we have a small defect of about a centimeter. 
we did a micro fracture and then we actually filled it in with a little bit of putty um, that um, is mixed with some um, of the patient's uh, PRP and helps to kind of consolidate and fill that defect. Um, we can also do um, a transplant procedure. So we can actually transplant healthy bone and cartilage into that defect. And we can do it from the patient's own knee or we can actually do it from a cadaver. Um, so when we do an, it's called an OATS, osteoarticular transfer, we're replacing that entire osteochondral unit. So it's like when you move the golf hole on a golf green. So you take a core and you get this little soil is like the bone and the grass is like the cartilage. And then you move that and you fill in the spot where the hole used to be and now you have a new hole. Um, the issue with that is, again, that's gonna create a secondary defect. Um, so we try to use it, get it from an area that's you know not a load bearing area, but it does create a defect. So that's why allograft is a little bit more attractive um, alternative. But here's a case where we had this kind of longer skinny defect. Um, we took two plugs from the anterior part of the femur and then transplanted them to fill that defect. I've been doing this a lot more in the elbow recently, especially in our gymnasts. Um, so here's a case uh, of a lesion here in the capitellum. And these larger lesions in the elbow, um, especially in a gymnast, um, they tend to not heal very well and um, very difficult for them to return to sport um, after that. So um, we'll often do this oats in the elbow and we'll use um, either their own bone or cadaver, uh, but most people don't want to have surgery on their knee for an elbow problem. So for the most part, we use cadaver um, grafts. So it looks kind of like this. Um, we use this little drill to kind of center ourselves within that lesion. And then here's our little coring device that kind of uh, reams out that unhealthy bone. And then this is actually after we put that little plug in and you can see it filling in that defect nicely. And this is how it looks arthroscopically um, or open. So here's that area, uh, which we saw on the MRI and it's basically hinged. It's just kind of hanging by a thread. So it's booked open there. Uh, we removed that, cleaned it out, and then, whoops, and then replaced it. So this is actually our new um, plug of bone in there. Unfortunately, um, like a lot of gymnasts, a year later she came in, and now she has the same problem on the other side. And um, we got to do the same thing on that uh, side as well. Um, and then, you know, we want to address our other factors, mechanical factors. So the good thing about having open feces is that we can use that. Um, not only does it promote healing or help um, uh, with the bone regeneration, but we can also use that to change the alignment of the bone in a way that's less invasive than actually cutting the bone. Um, so we can do something called guided growth. So this is a patient who had bilateral lesions um, that had failed conservative treatment. And when we got an x-ray, a standing film, we could see that he had actually a varus alignment. So he's a little bit bow-legged which is gonna put more stress on these lesions and prevent them from healing. So we did a guided growth procedure. So we did these little staple or um, plates rather around the growth plates. Um, we did an extra articular drilling. And then six months later, you can see we've corrected his alignment. So he has a nice neutral alignment and those lesions have healed, which is great. So in an older patient with closed growth plates, we'd have to cut the bone and put in a big plate and screws and have a much more um, invasive procedure. But in a patient who's still growing, we can do this um, pretty easily um, in really a minimally invasive way. Um, and if you remember that the meniscus is our friend too. Um, so this is a, a case, a seven-year-old who had an OCD. So that's quite young for an OCD, but he actually had a meniscal um, abnormality, a discoid meniscus. Um, and the meniscus was torn and basically um, he had no meniscus in the back of his knee. So you can see this lesion here, and there's really, you can see the normal anterior meniscus here, and there's really nothing in the back. And then you can see that lesion again laterally there. Um, so you can see he had this tear in the back of the meniscus. Um, we kind of reconstructed the meniscus and did our drilling, and then again, he healed that lesion. And then even for older um, kids, so this is a, a an older patient who had the same problem with the meniscus that was undiagnosed, um, developed an OCD um, with actually a loose body. Um, so you can see there's the defect there. 
And um, again, similar looking meniscus, loose body in the back. And we actually put that piece of bone back, screwed it back in there. Um, and you can see she really has no functional meniscus. Uh, and we came back and did a meniscus um, transplant. So we actually gave her a cadaveric meniscus and that bone went on to heal. Actually, we took the screw out eventually. Um, and she went back to playing uh, golf. She played college golf. So in conclusion, um, OCD is a tough problem. Um, it remains a challenging problem about in pediatric orthopedics. Um, we just, there's still a lot to learn about really the etiology and the biology and the treatment. Um, we're seeing it a lot more frequently. Um, so, you know, it's really important that we understand um, that this is a thing that happens and who's at risk for it, um, which again is mainly going to be our um, high level athletes, gymnasts, throwers. But even so, um, there are patients who do not fit the bill um, who develop OCD. Um, obesity is a risk factor. So, um, just because they don't look like um, the classic athlete, um, if they do have symptoms that suggest OCD, we should check it out. Um, the other thing that's difficult is that the healing process can be quite protracted, even with surgery. Um, it's, you know, at least um, three to six months before they're doing any kind of impact activity. Um, so this really can take a toll on a child and a family. Um, obviously, there's the physical risks. So there's risks associated with surgery. And what I try to tell parents is there's, there's risks associated with not doing surgery. So that lesion can get worse. It can become more difficult to treat. It can become a bigger problem. Um, and then there's the psychosocial risk factors or um, complications. So there's time away from sport. Um, there can be a lot of family dynamics. Dad wants surgery. Dad wants the kid to go back. Mom doesn't want surgery. Um, or, you know, trying to enforce like, hey, you can't do sports. You can't do this. Um, with a 13 year old boy who has never done anything but play sports. So that can take a real toll on a family. So um, it's a tough problem. Um, I think that our division um, has a lot of experience with it. And I think um, we're adept at kind of um, navigating a lot of these issues. And um, I think this is a case where shared decision making is really important um, and really dealing with someone who kind of has a good familiarity with the problem and uh, the issues not just um, in the knee, but also in the patient and the family as a whole. So with that, um, I will open it up for questions if you have any. We have we have some great questions. So um, so first of all, thank you for that great presentation. Um, very, very thorough. And um, I'm, I'm sure everyone really learned a lot. So thank you for that. Um, so questions are piling in here. And while I ask those, uh, give time for people to ask some more questions. But so the, I'm sure weightlifting would um, lead to OCD, but it, would it be different kinds of weightlifting or or when a kid starts weightlifting, is it, would that have, a, have an effect? Um, so I, anything that is putting increased load on the joint can potentially cause OCD. Um, we tend to see it more in like the high impact um, activities. So like, you know, basketball, soccer, um, gymnastics, things like that. Um, but anything that's putting more stress on the joint could potentially be a risk factor for OCD. Okay. Does blood flow restriction help with the healing process of OCD? That is a great question. Um, I don't think anyone's done a study on that per se. Um, I think the theoretical advantage of doing blood flow restriction is that you can um, activate the muscles um, at a higher level than you would normally without putting stress on the joint. Um, so I don't know that it would necessarily improve the healing rate, but it's something that you could do to kind of um, maintain strength and function of the joint without putting as much load on the cartilage uh, but again a lot of the studies on that are you know more in the adult literature and they're dealing more with like meniscus or cartilage injuries in an adult um, but i think there are some theoretical advantages for it in uh, ocd in young patients but i don't know that it's been shown yet okay 
And Deanna writes in, she says, the only kiddo she's treated with OCD had bilateral unstable lesions at his knees and a uh, comorbidity of turrets with very physical ticks, stomping, jumping, et cetera. Have you seen any correlation between Tourette's and OCD? Um, I have not. Um, I have seen, um, um, no, I haven't, that's a good question. Um, I've seen it a lot uh, of kids who are anti-inflammatory, you know, medicines um, for rheumatologic conditions or for Crohn's and things like that, um, which may be like, you know, a potential side effect of medications or uh, an indication of generalized inflammatory process. Um, but I have not really seen it in Tourette's per se, but um, certainly if someone is engaging that sort of thing, it could uh, potentially be a risk factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is a BMI a concern, uh, a child's BMI? Yes, um, so there are definitely studies that show um, an association of OCD with obesity. Um, so that is a concern. You know, as you know, when, you, when your weight increases, it's almost multiplicative in terms of the load on the joint. Um, you know, it's not a straight line correlation. Um, so um, unfortunately, um, we're seeing a lot of weight gain um, over the last year. We're probably seeing kids doing a lot less sports, but the flip side is we're seeing more weight gain. So I don't know, maybe after these kids gained 30 pounds and then they go back to sports this spring, we might see more of this. I don't know. Yeah, you know, and, I, and that's a good segue into the question I've been asking all afternoon. Uh, apologies to the folks who've been hearing the same question, but, you know, kids are going back to sports, right? And they haven't been they, you know, they have been, they've been inactive for over a year. I mean, and he's, you know, can we get a little bit of your input? We've heard some great stuff from Dr. Patel and Dr. Carl, Jackie Turner today. What, how about some input from you? What do you have to say? Yeah, I mean, and I know that everyone's going to be excited when things, you know, open up and sports start again. You know, the big thing is really, you know, you have to get in shape um, before you start any of these things, especially in upper extremity sport like throwing. Um, but really, I mean, Bone uh, is a dynamic organ and it responds to the stress that's placed on it. So if there's not a lot of stress on the bone, it's, you know, it's going to kind of go dormant. Um, mm -hmm. And then if all of a sudden you crank it up to a level 10, the bone is not going to be able to handle that kind of stress. So um, we need to build up gradually, um, you know, start with conditioning, work into game shape. Um, I know a lot of these seasons are going to be very compressed this year, you know, five week, six week seasons. So um, and there's going to obviously be a real um, temptation to just, you know, all of a sudden ramp it back up. But, you know, you really have oh, to yeah. take the time to um, get in shape and um, build that endurance, build the bone density. Mm -hmm. Your muscle tendons, too, um, need to be stressed as well. So, um, yeah, you got to have patience, I guess, right? I mean, these, these kids yeah. have been, they probably want to go right at it and probably same with the coaches. So we got to keep them. Uh, keep them uh, uh, level a little bit, but I'm um, still keep them active. But hey, this has been a great, great talk um, for the folks who've been hanging on. Uh, sorry, we went a little over today, but uh, well worth it. Um, so I would just like to uh, close out by saying uh, Dr. Finlayson sees patients at our new Skokie facility, at our Lincoln Park office, and in our Northbrook uh, Outpatient Center and Surgery Center. And you can reach Dr. Finlayson at 312-227-6190. He has a direct line of 312-227-6509. He's been very kind to share his cell phone for emergency information, 312-330-5435. And he can be emailed at cjfinlayson at lurychildrens.org. And if you're able to rapid connect or epic in-basket message uh, can be done as well. And as I said, these, uh, these are being recorded, so this will be sent out to you. And we will also have contact information emailed out to you for all of our physicians that you got to see today. Um, I'd encourage you to come to our last session today at five o'clock where Dr. Cynthia LaBella will be presenting pediatric ankle injuries. Uh, but uh, that said, Dr. Finlayson, anything you'd like to add? No, um, thanks for having me. And um, hope to see you soon.
in person. All right. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. And everybody, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks.